Good morning. And what an absolutely glorious California day it is. Thank you for all coming to track 2014. We have a truly international group here from over 12 countries, 29 states. I hope you get to meet one another, and I plan to meet every one of you. Now, I would like to uh, turn the podium over to my, my dear friend and conference chair, Michael Pierce. <clears throat> Michael is a faculty member at the Art Department of California Lutheran University, and he's a curator of the Quang Fong Gallery of Art and Culture. Michael is a figurative painter and installation artist whose work repeatedly refers to ancient history, mythology, and folklore through the use of symbolism and imagery to address the mystical relationship of man and God. In 2010, he introduced the Atelier system to the CLU Art Department, in which each faculty member is provided their own studio space on campus and welcome their students to welcome to the students to study alongside them as they create their own art. Michael, you talk louder. <laughs> Michael, here. Hey, thanks, Mike. Loud enough? <laughs> All right. Hey, how are you doing? Good morning. All right, track 2014. Can you believe it? We've done it. I'm so glad to see you all here. Guess what? We're doing it again. Next year, we'll do it again. I don't know where and I don't know when, but we're going to do it. So we're gradually, slowly changing the direction of the ship a little bit. All of us together, not just track, I mean all of us, people in this room, are slowly changing the direction of the cultural ocean liner and turning it around the corner a little bit. So I want to thank you for participating in doing that because we really, really need to do that. We've got to change the direction of the ship and make, uh, make the world a better place, right? And we can do that by, by changing the world. Um, with that, uh, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Roger Scruton. Uh, Roger is well known among us uh, for his incisive book, Beauty, uh, which explores the, this timeless concept and, and uh, tries to make sense of what beauty is in the postmodern age, uh, what, uh, what is going on, what makes it beautiful. Uh, he's best known, uh, perhaps, for his BBC Two television show, Why Beauty Matters. Uh, which I'm sure nearly everyone in this room must have seen. Uh, it's a very, very popular show among us. Uh, it caused some controvers controversy when uh, it first came out, of course. Um, Roger graduated from Cambridge University and taught later at Boston University while building a public affairs consultancy in Eastern Europe. Uh, since then, he's been a freelance writer and consultant. Uh, currently, he's a visiting professor at Oxford University and he's a fellow at Blackfriars Hall there at Oxford, and senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center in Washington, DC. Uh, Roger is one of my heroes, and I'm extraordinarily pleased to have him here to speak to us today. So please welcome Roger Scruton. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Now, I'm uh, here really on, on false pretenses because that, the film that you've, as Michael said, you've, you've probably all seen, uh, was really only a byproduct of my, my own real interests, which are in philosophy and abstract ideas. Uh, and I was inveigled into doing it by people at the BBC uh, who, um, Offered, offered me some terms that I couldn't refuse at the time. Uh, and um, you know, I got really interested, however, in the course of doing it, and realized that my abstract philosophy, which some of which is contained in that little book on beauty, it would be of no use to anyone if it couldn't translate itself into images uh, and uh, uh, personal presentations of the kind that I tried in that film. So today, I'm going to come back to some of the <clears throat> philosophical thoughts behind uh, what I was talking about then. Uh, and 
address the, the whole question of, of uh, faking it, F how, one, how we get through life by faking, uh, and how faking is sometimes something which is unavoidable and which has a whole artistic uh, tradition uh, behind it. <clears throat> and uh, I think to, to understand just what it means to be a fake uh, is something which is really important to us in the world in which we live. Uh, because, after all, we know that there are occasions when we've got to do it, but we also know that there, are, there is a deep need in all of us for the reality, the, the, the truth behind the faking, and that's one of the things that we expect art to do for us, to present the human condition in ways that don't falsify, that don't make it uh, into some cheap, sugary version of itself, but actually present the truth but present it in a way that enables us also to accept it. And I think that ideal of art is something that I'm sure all the people in this room share. Why, why would one be a representational artist if it weren't because one wants to show the world as it really is, and in doing so, give people the kind of consolation uh, that, they, that, it, that comes to them through knowing the truth. And I think this, um, this idea that art should guide us in this way to the deep truth of things is something which uh, uh, I think we need to defend and is under attack in the world in which we live. Now I'm going to put on the screen various um, slides with, with thoughts on them. I know that as, as visual artists you're probably hostile to w the written word, aren't you? Uh, and, and <laughs> especially when it contains abstract thoughts. But uh, there won't be too many of these, but it's just so that you have something to look at while I try to explain my meaning. Uh, and I think the first thing that uh, I would like to impress on you is that there is a difference between lying and faking. Uh, a, a, someone who tells a lie deceives his victim. That's the whole point of it. Um, uh, but a fake is someone who deceives himself. He's somebody who isn't just telling lies about what he is to others, but he's also uh, creating for himself uh, an unreal personality which will be sufficient to take himself in. Uh, and when people fake things, they, they sometimes do it together. There's a kind of complicit deception which we see um, frequently in the modern world, not least, as I'm sure you realize, in, in the art schools. You know, that, uh, uh, if, if you look at uh, the shows of people like Damien Hirst uh, and Tracy Emin, who are at the art establishment in London, uh, you will always see that, that they are surrounded by people who are busily, busily confirming them in their completely self-deceived opinion of themselves. <laughs> uh, and this is mutual. Uh, the, the, the critics... <laughs> The, the critics themselves are flattered by the artists into, into believing of themselves that they have the ability to see uh, the real aesthetic meaning of things. So you, you, uh, there's a kind of um, uh, almost a ballet uh, of complicit deception. And it's not just uh, beliefs that can be faked, you know, as when I tell a lie or, or, or pretend to believe something and then deceive myself into believing it. We can fake our emotions, and that happens all the time. Sometimes, you know, our good manners require us to pretend to emotions that we don't have. Obviously, somebody who at a funeral actually said what he really thought about the dear departed would not be welcome. Uh, but uh, So most of us in those circumstances have to uh, uh, be prepared to, um, to deceive, not to deceive, but just to pretend. But um, there is a kind of pretense in emotion where we take ourselves in uh, and think while, while pretending to feel something that we really do feel it. And that's the sort of the thought that, uh, that we are familiar with from sentimentality in the arts. Uh, and people have make fake claims to eminence. People believe themselves to be the geniuses uh, that uh, um, others will, will think them to be, provided they believe it. So faking is a kind of achievement. Lying is not. You can, to tell, anybody can tell lies. It's sufficient to in, have a certain intention. You know, I just intend to say what is untrue in the hope of deceiving you. But faking is an achievement. That's something where 
I actually change the way things are. I change my own nature um, into something which takes me in and also takes you in too. So faking has always got a kind of success to it. <clears throat> and that brings me to the topic of kitsch. Uh, many people in this room I know have thought about this and, and Odd, of course, has, has written some very interesting and profound things about just what kitsch um, really is in the world in which we live. Uh, and I su suspect that I'm talking about uh, perhaps a, a pre um, nerdrum uh, concept of, of, of kitsch in, in what I go on to say. When the concept was first introduced in the early 20th century, it was uh, always a term of abuse. You know, something to call a work of art kitsch or anything kitsch is to suggest that in some way it, it is, belongs in the world of fakes, the world of fake emotions. And, and fake emotions uh, appeal to us because they're less demanding than real ones. You know, real love is a, is a problem, as you all know. Uh, um, but fake love has a lot of benefits attached to it with very few costs. So um, in that area, uh, it, uh, kitsch has a, a kind of purchase on things. But is a, there's a sort of mystery to kitsch. Uh, you know, when did it begin? Uh, it seems odd. If it is just simply another name for faking emotions, it ought to have been a permanent part of the human condition. But in art, if we look back over the centuries, you know, there's a lot of primitive art in the Middle Ages, but nobody, would, I think, now would say that it was kitsch. Some, you know, those, those frescoes of sinners being uh, dragged down into hell by demons or lifted up to heaven by angels are on the uh, frescoes of, in frescoes on country churches all over uh, Italy and, uh, and Romania and so on. You, you, you don't think of those as kitsch. You think, yes, they're naive and perhaps a little bit silly, but nevertheless there's something genuine behind all this, however incompetent it is. But it's only when we get to the um, mid-18th century, perhaps even late 18th century, that, that the idea of kitsch begins to s seem plausible. I mentioned there Murillo and Groes. I'll give you a couple of examples in a minute. But it's very odd that something like this should have a beginning. You know, it should have been always with us, like original sin. Um, and maybe, you know, some, somebody might say, well, it is a manifestation of original sin, the desire to get out of life by faking it. Isn't that just precisely what evil is in the end? Well, that would be a thought, but, I, you know, nevertheless, it is, as we understand it, something that re began for us, either in the 18th century, or at least took, took off then, but became really urgent towards the end of the 19th century. And it's not only about painting. Composers wrestled with this problem. Mahler uh, famously wrestled with the, uh, with the problem of banality and cliché in his symphonies. And he even went to see Freud, of all people, in the hope of getting a cure for his, um, uh, for his weakness. You know, the, the fact that he's got to the great climax in the first movement and he has to bring in uh, a, a little uh, Viennese dancing band with a, with a, with a corny old waltz tune uh, instead of a proper climax. Why, why is that? Why does this come over me all the time, he says to, to Freud, who was characteristically unhelpful in response. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> and at that time, the time of Mahler, it was a, regarded as a general, general problem, especially in the, of course, the late Austro-Hungarian Empire to which Mahler belonged. The word kitsch actually comes to us probably from Yiddish and probably from uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, and writers like Musil and Krauss uh, wrestled with this problem, and T.S. Eliot did as well. And T.S. Eliot's famous less essays on criticism and his uh, great poem, The Wasteland, constitute a sort of uh, comprehensive rejection uh, of the temptations uh, to write kitsch poetry, which he associated with the Georgian school of his time, let's say the school of George V in England, people like Walter de la Mer and so on. But I think it's a yet more important point is that art is not the only sphere that we, is colonized by kitsch. Religion is just as important, maybe more so. Uh, and um, you know, here's a, <laughs> something which you're, you're all familiar with. Uh, and it, it, this <clears throat> 
th this, this disease settled, especially upon the, uh, uh, the Roman Catholic faith during, during the course of the 20th century, and it's almost impossible now to find a, a holy object which doesn't have some, some uh, contagious impression of it. Um, but here, to going back over the history, here is one of Murillo's um, endearing little, uh, little ruffians, uh, a very famous picture. Uh, and many people would say, yeah, it's, it's beautiful, um, it's characteristic and so on, but isn't there some kind of um, falsehood there, sentimentalization of, uh, of, of, an, of the naughty boy and so on? Don't we see the beginnings in those eyes of the, of the fake emotion? And here, of course, is Murillo's um, uh, virgin and child, you know, tremendously accomplished. Um, but if you put beside it Bellini, don't you think there is something, something real here which, which Murillo has failed to capture? That Murillo is, is giving us certainly an ordinary woman and an ordinary baby, but the, the best they can do by way uh, of sacred, uh, 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 creating a sacred atmosphere around their relation it, uh, it is by turning their eyes in that winsome way uh, half towards the observer. Whereas here you have a kind of vision of celestial peace which actually is not simply contained in the faces and the, and the posture of the figures but in the blue of the Virgin's dress. You know, there's, there's a way of painting, uh, painting holiness into her which um, seems to have disappeared by the time you get to the Murillo. I, th I say this not dogmatically because of course I, I, you know, if I could even paint uh, a tenth as well as Murillo, I would think I was a, a genius. But nevertheless, uh, this uh, I'm trying to explain why people think that a kind of falsehood was creeping in by Murillo's time. Here is Greur's picture of, a, of another little infant who's um, worrying over a wounded bird. Um, and again, Greur's, of course, a gr another great painter who is often picked out as, as the, the starting point of the great kitsch uh, trajectory. But um, I just want to say a few things. This is where I get back to abstract ideas again, uh, with apologies. There's a law uh, called Gresham's Law, formulated by um, uh, Gresham, who was a, a 17th century uh, uh, economist, 16th century, late 16th, early 17th century co um, economist, who was considered uh, the effects of uh, uh, the contamination of the coinage of the day. You know, uh, monarchs would clip the edges off coins um, in order to uh, uh, retain some of the gold or mix the gold with, a, with some alloy uh, so, so as to debase its value. So there was always in circulation uh, both good cu currency, the real thing, the real gold or silver coin, and the bad currency which, uh, which imitated it. And... Um, his law, very simple, is that bad currency drives out good. In other words, if you've got in your hand the real gold coins and also the fake gold coins, when it comes to the market transaction, you're going to give the fake gold coins and keep the real ones. Uh, and in general, the, uh, everybody will be of this persuasion, and within, within months, uh, there will only be the fake ones in circulation, and those fake ones will then be discovered, will, will be recognized to be far less uh, valuable, and the result will be inflation. Right, so, you know, um, and something like that, that's so obviously true in economics, but something like that works also with the life of the mind. That false goods exchange more easily because they cost less to the person who offloads them, but promise to bring the same reward. You know, if I, if I can um, get the same from you by pretending to love you uh, that I would get by actually loving you, suppose in a, in a case of seduction, you know, I go for the pretend love, don't I? I get the same reward, uh, but it's no cost, or a much lower cost. You know, so in the world of emotions, these, the pretend emotions, provided the others are, are taken in by them so I can get the reward, um, they tend to drive out the, the real ones. And that's a, to some extent, that is what people have been saying about kitsch, isn't it? If you think back down the years, that somehow the, the, that our emotional currency has been debased. Uh, uh, and that surely the role of art is to put a stop to this, to, to remind us of this fact and to say, look, there is real love, there are real emotions. That's what uh, 
how we should live. And here are the examples. You know, uh, and um, I think it, it, I'm persuaded by that, that insofar as art has uh, a single universal function, it would be something like that, of bringing us back to the truth of our condition and saying, look, there are real feelings and not just fake ones. And, uh, and that we can get through our life dealing in, with this, in this fake currency, but we, in the end, uh, the real reward of life will not come to us. Uh, and fake philosophy and, and fake religion uh, work like this. Uh, and I'll just say a few things about the, the problem of religion. Everybody, I'm sure, in this room who's, who's traveled around Europe, especially to the more um, pious parts of Italy and, and uh, Spain and so on, will have had the experience of seeing uh, the, and contrasting the cultivated tourist and the pious peasant. Okay, um, religion is declining in Europe and all that, but nevertheless, it's a perfectly normal sight to see the, uh, the cultivated um, uh, American tourist usually appallingly dressed in Bermuda shorts and things, sta <laughs> standing in front of a, of a great uh, a statue by Donatello. And next to him, a simple widow in her weeds, on her knees, praying to St. Dominic in plastic. Uh, you know, uh, of a kind which, uh, like, uh, like that holy family I illustrated. And the, and the thought comes into your mind, whose emotion is the real one? You know, uh, the, the tourist doesn't believe a word of all this stuff, but is nevertheless very well informed. He's read his Bernard Berenson and all this kind of stuff, uh, uh, and he thinks that this is a great work of art, and he can probably give a, an, uh, an intelligent description of, of its metaphysical meaning and all that. But um, he will move on happily to the next thing and add that to his uh, diary and, uh, you know, and, uh, and so uh, proceed in the normal way of tourists of, of collecting uh, interesting impressions. Whereas the little peasant on her knees, for her, nothing matters except her communication through this piece of kitsch with the divinity. Uh, and surely she has the real belief, uh, and to her it really matters, and maybe she's pouring out uh, a, a, a simple but, but genuine heart into, uh, in, in her prayers, which the tourist has lost all sight of. So, that, you know, and I think we, we do, we're all aware of this contrast, aren't we? We, we are very sophisticated people uh, and go through the world holding our beliefs in suspension uh, and uh, looking at works of art without sharing necessarily in the worldview that created them. I'm, you know, many people in this room probably don't share the worldview of Bellini, Giovanni Bellini in that beautiful picture of the Virgin and Child, but nevertheless uh, recognize that this is an extraordinary icon uh, of the holy, uh, the holy condition of motherhood. And so, you know, we are able to talk about it, to think about it, to take it into our lives, but maybe the kitsch object has a, a function in the lives of people who really believe, and that is a very worrying thing. Uh, maybe there is a reality that feeds on fakes. Um, and, and, and maybe we are asking too much if we ask people to jettison kitsch, you know. Shouldn't, should people get rid of all those little uh, holy family images that I showed earlier uh, and live as though um, they were all art historians who uh, won't tolerate a picture of the Virgin unless it's done by one of the Renaissance greats, you know. Surely that's demanding too much. Uh, and also is a kind of snobbery towards the real emotions of simple people. So there is a, a, a question here, uh, and we know that there is a reality behind that religious kitsch, a, a, a realm of experience, but we think that that realm of experience can be captured in other and better terms. Uh, and one thought that occurs to me is that the, the kitsch uh, religious object can't possibly have a meaning to anybody who does not have the associated religious beliefs. Whereas the non-kitsch object, the real work, like the Bellini, can have a meaning for all of us. We don't actually have to share the, the Roman Catholic vision of the holiness of motherhood in order to see that that vision is a real possibility and has a real meaning. And we can see that from Bellini in the way that we couldn't from the kitsch object.
So there are, maybe there is a way out of this dilemma that we can accept that there is religious feeling that requires kitsch uh, objects as its vehicle uh, without thinking that kitsch is therefore somehow more real for those the people who use it. I'd say something about fake philosophy, but I don't really want, I think that will uh, distract us from the topic. But I, um, I was going to give some, I give some examples there. Um, this is really perhaps not relevant to you, except that if, if you go, if you make the mistake of going to a, um, a university and um, studying in a hu humanities department, uh, uh, you, you will inevitably find yourself surrounded these days by fake philosophy, usually um, uh, with a French name attached to it. Attached to it. <laughs> Uh, I give some, a couple of quotations there, um, uh, just so that you know that there is such a thing. I, I, I won't read, uh, yeah, I'll read the first of them by Jacques Lacan. Jacques Lacan was a, uh, a, a so-called psychoanalyst uh, and a total fraud, but uh, very influential. Uh, it is the connection between signifier and signifier that permits the elision in which the signifier installs the lack of being in the object relation using the value of reference back possessed by signification in order to invest it with the desire aimed at the very lack it supports. Right, now, um, I have studied that sentence for a long time. Uh, and. I think it, 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 it will be very you could make a very interesting poem by taking all those words and rearranging them in all the combinations that they, uh, that they offer, uh, and the result w would certainly never uh, be, uh, arrive at a meaning. <laughs> but um, th there's a kind of new speak that grows uh, uh, into our academic language, what I would call an ingrown mental toenail, uh, which, uh, uh, which is... Um, constantly nagging at the, at the area of thought without producing anything. And the use of language to say nothing. Uh, and the kind of nothing that comes out of this is nothing with a capital N. Uh, and it reminds us of the fact that faking is a, a social activity. Um, uh, and it's been extremely successful in the university. Uh, the, because the university is a social milieu, and a lot of people there are, commit, uh, are competing for these enormous rewards. Let's face it, you get $100,000 a year for doing nothing except filling in forms. Um, or you can do. Um, yeah, you, you see students every now and then. But if you, when you see students, if you can just give them a lot of that, you, know, you can take it off the internet and give it to them and say, this is, this is your reading for this week, and you're there. Uh, and so you just, you know, the, the social community can actually survive by this kind of faking, uh, although it does require talent of a particular kind. You know, uh, I don't think many people in this room could actually uh, produce a sentence like the one I've just read. Uh, but all, all over the academic world you find the emergence of this kind of nonsense, a, a kind of complicit relation between the author and the reader. A nonsense of this kind is a, a bid for acceptance. What Lacan is really saying is that here's a load of nonsense, you can have this nonsense too, and we can be in it together. You know? And, and I, 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 will, I will authenticate your essays, and you will authenticate my philosophy, uh, and, um, and the money will go on circulating as before. Uh, and this is another example of Gresham's law, in other words, of bad thought driving out good as bad thought circulates much more easily, because it, it being cost-free. Uh, Alain, Alain Sokal and Jean Briquemont wrote a book about this called Fashionable Nonsense, which I recommend to you. Uh, and Malcolm Bradbury, our great English novelist and now alas dead, wrote a little novel called Mensonge um, about it too. So it's not as though people haven't noticed this. But there's a, an underlying agenda here uh, uh, that the, that kind of nonsense promises liberation from the oppressive structures, including those which belong to thought itself. Uh, and so it's a little bit like mystical religion, which says, you know, I can give you the benefits of religion without the problem of actually having to believe anything. Just uh, quote the necessary words. Well, now, this brings me back to the, to the area of art. 
uh, and whether there is faking, uh, uh, faking it in art, and if so, what form it takes. And, and I think uh, we have to, again, to look a little bit historically uh, at our condition. Uh, in the course of the 18th century, there arose, as I'm sure you know, the cult of genius. Um, books were written about genius. Kant inc included in his aesthetic philosophy the idea of genius as the distinctive condition of the artist, that, that um, somehow an artist has a, a different position vis-a-vis -vis reality from the rest of us. We can go around the world understanding it using the ordinary tools of science uh, and, and conversation. We can obey the rules, we can make things, uh, works of craft, by, by uh, learning techniques and so on. But the artist lives in a different way. He, he produces things uh, through his genius which couldn't have been predicted. You can't make a work of art by following the rules. You can't produce it uh, simply by learning uh, the science uh, of the materials and all the rest. You have to have this extra spark which uh, you will which imprints your original identity on the thing that you produce. Uh, and it involves not just knowledge of the world, but also knowledge of the heart. Uh, and so all real artworks have to be original on this view. They have to, be, have to contain that thing which is unique to the person who made them, the, uh, the genius which is his, uh, which could never be predicted or never be reduced to any kind of rule-guided procedure. Now, that, that thought is a, an interesting thought philosophically, but of course it, it becomes a kind of cliché, doesn't it? That, that uh, um, if that is the case, uh, people think, then only what is original can be considered to be art. Uh, and then the next stage is to think, well, um, perhaps uh, it's not just that only what is original can be considered to be art. It, it perhaps, it's perhaps is that um, it's sufficient to be original. You know, all we have to do is do something that's not been done before, and that will be a great work of art. Uh, and, um, you know, like Damien Hirst's uh, uh, Pickles Animals, you know, no, nobody would have thought of doing this until he did it, uh, quite rightly. But the, ver <coughs> the, the, the very fact that he did it uh, means that he has already passed the only test that people recognize, namely, he's done something that hasn't, hasn't been done before. Uh, and then the artists and the critics move in to say, yes, this is all wonderful, and, they, uh, and the, the same kind of complicit circle uh, arises of people who, who have taken themselves in, and they're taking themselves in collectively. Uh, and we've seen this uh, in the art world and also the world of music and, and so on. Marcel Duchamp famously produced the, uh, the, his urinal uh, and signed it uh, and put it in a museum. Uh, and it was an you know, amusing thing to have done at the time. Uh, but it gave people the thought that, yeah, that's, that's all I need to do, something like that. Uh, and if you go to a graduating class in um, most of the London art schools, you'll just find, effectively, a uh, hundred urinals. They're slightly di each slightly different. So one might not be uh, in porcelain, you know, or, you know, but it will be something similar, the same idea just putting on display something that nobody would have thought to have been a work of art uh, until it was put on display. And, and the same thing happened in music, as you know, with John Cage's uh, amusing experiments of sitting down in front of a piano with a uh, full concert dress uh, and, and doing nothing. Uh, and, um, but the, the interesting thing is that uh, uh, theoreticians like Arthur Danto come along and say, yes, this is, this is what it's all about. That's where art has got to. Art has at last become conscious of itself, and that is the end of art. You know, art only exists so long as it is not conscious of itself, but being becoming conscious of itself, it raises the question, am I art? And that question is the end of art. That's Dan Danto's famous thesis taken from Hegel. But it only makes sense, that thesis, if you look at a very narrow range of extremely untalented people, like Marcel Duchamp and John Cage. You know, uh, at the same time as John Cage was sitting at his piano in his um, concert dress, 
uh, Stravinsky was uh, writing his neoclassical stuff. Um, you know, Vaughan Williams was still writing symphonies. Shostakovich still writing symphonies. You know, great works of music were being produced, uh, which uh, have gone on communicating to the mass of uh, music lovers ever since. Um, so it, you know, it's what has happened is that what was conceived by some clever pranksters as a kind of joke against art uh, has been elevated to the condition of all future art. Uh, and um, uh, this is partly because people have a fear of fakes. There's a, this, is, this is what came into their mind with the whole uh, um, re revulsion against kitsch that people like Clement Greenberg introduced. You know, that, we can't, we can't produce these fakes. On, only original gestures will be accepted. But original gestures, as I said, they can't be repeated, and yet we see nothing but the repetition of Duchamp's urinal. Nor, nor does repetition of the unoriginal produce something original. You know? and, uh, um, although I know it's um, heresy to say so, uh, Andy Warhol's Brillo boxes are, are not original. Um, and um, nor are they works of art of any significance, at least. But nevertheless, um, uh, people, because they're so afraid, afraid of fakes, they have introduced a kind of fake originality. Uh, and this is something which we see all the time in the art world today. Harold Rosenberg wrote a famous essay on this, on the tradition of the new, saying that, in effect, um, Artists since the mid-20th century have been so devoted to the idea of novelty that that idea itself had become a tradition uh, and that we have always to put our art in the framework of, no of, of, uh, of the idea of novelty if it is to be considered seriously by the, by the critics. But um, I think it's probably more true to say that when so conceived, art isn't really new, it's just, it's just transgressive and transgression becomes a cliché. Here's an example. Uh, the Chapman brothers, a singularly loathsome pair of artists uh, uh, in the English school, whose originality consists, as you see, in dissolving um, the objects of an intensely paedophile emotion uh, and uh, 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 equipping them out with uh, uh, awful things like penises instead of noses and so on and ridiculous shoes. Uh, it's offensive not only in what it does to the human body, but also in, in the emotions that it, that it is uh, stimulating in the observer. And for that very reason, because it transgresses all kinds of moral norms, uh, and uh, not to speak of aesthetic norms, it, it counts as something original. And it is very interesting that it's two people who produced this. That this is a, ever since Gilbert and George, those two um, uh, uh, artists produced by St. Martin's School in London, it has become quite normal for young art students to do things together as a pair, and by way of, as it were, defying the old idea of genius, saying this isn't a, a, an individual thing, we're doing this together, but it's still original. You know, it's original because it's a, a defiance of the surrounding world. But it isn't sufficient to defy things uh, in order to uh, do something interesting. So that brings me to the question, what is, is real kitsch? Um, here is a genuine fake. Um, this is obviously the sort of thing that people have had in mind when they've uh, discussed uh, kitsch, that, that uh, an object in which fake emotions are being encouraged in the viewer uh, and given a, a kind of symbolic expression in the object. Uh, and there was a, an, an establishment arose in response to that kind of thing. Clement Greenberg, in a famous essay, uh, said, written in 1939, I think, in Partisan Review, said that uh, the, all modern art is at a crossroads. It, it can go in one of two ways. It can, go, uh, it can join the avant-garde or it can be kitsch. There's no third way. You know, if, if you're not with the avant-garde, uh, all you produce is um, banal, cliché-ridden, uh, and, um, and fake. 
Uh, and th this was incredibly influential, this essay, uh, and it, it corresponded to a, a feeling in, in the other arts as well, in music and literature, that somehow the ordinary language of artistic expression, like representation in painting, or like tonality in music, or the ordinary rhythms of prose, uh, that the, these have become unavailable because they'd been too much used. They'd become cliches. And if you tried to use them again, all you would produce is kitsch, uh, fake art. And that, uh, of course, is responsible for the movement to atonality in music under the influence of Schoenberg and to modernism in, in literary prose under the influence of Joyce. So that modernism became a kind of cult that, that we must, that this was the way to flee the whole uh, disaster of cliché. But I think the flight from cliché tends to end in cliché, uh, as in this example. This is Barnett Newman. You know, um, you know Barnett Newman, of course, very famous um, American painter who, who produced, okay, it's not very well re reflected on this screen. Uh, um, it has a, uh, there are two colors there, not one. But um, the, the, the <coughs> Barnett Newman was responsible for producing some, some thousand or so of these, uh, which one could reasonably say are themselves cliches, a cliché kind of uh, abstraction. Uh, so the great question is, why do we object to cliché and kitsch? Uh, and that uh, brings me back to what I was saying about faking it. Um, we think that there is such a thing as real emotion, uh, and uh, we also think that people can substitute unreal emotions for the real ones, and that there's a difference between the, th the real ones and the unreal ones. The real ones, in some sense, cannot be sold. They can't be put on, dis put on sale or, or made into, into merely marketable things. They are things which are precious to us uh, and belong with us uh, as, as possessions. Uh, and um, let me just give you a couple of examples. Uh, here is a, um, this is a handbag which you can buy uh, in Italy, um, which is obviously an abuse of real art to, to, to sell an object. But you're not, you never, the, the real, the, the, the great work of art, uh, um, Leonardo's Last Supper, which is being abused, does not sell anything at all. It expresses a sublime moment uh, in the Christian narrative in a way which uh, is a permanent possession of all those who, who uh, perceive it. Uh, and here's a fake art which is being used to sell Elvis Presley in his late years of decline uh, uh, and trying to show you that Jesus uh, can forgive even him. Um, and, uh, but the great question is, you know, does it... I, I, is this really meant? What, what, is, what is it saying? Isn't it just uh, uh, another piece of false emotion? Uh, and here is a, a famous work of art. Most people uh, who have been brought up with any kind of critical understanding or any kind of knowledge of the, uh, of the whole kitsch problem will see, look at this thing by, by Jeff Koons and say, no, he can't possibly mean this. Uh, you know, um, and... Um, it's just so, so awful uh, that he must have something else in mind than, uh, uh, than just to present this. Um, and that's true of this too. Um, you know, how can somebody have such a high opinion of himself as to think that his uh, little uh, balloon dogs set next to an elegant classical building like that deserve anything other than to be punctured? But uh, they... <laughs> This is something which I, I call preemptive kitsch. The, um, it's, it's a new kind of faking. It, it, there's a fake emotion in that uh, Michael Jackson uh, and monkey picture, which is also connected with a kind of fake rejection of a fake emotion. He's saying, look, this is so fake, you can't believe that I mean it. Uh, and uh, and um, so, you know, I, I'm only... I'm actually rejecting this, but only sort of rejecting it. So the whole thing is being put in, in uh, quotation marks. as a, a chain of pretense. I'm, I'm pretending to the emotion, I'm pretending to reject that emotion, and I'm pretending that I'm not rejecting that, reje that emotion at the same time. There's a long chain of pretense, 
And where does it end? Perhaps it, it need never end. There's a kind of meta-language of the fake culture. You'll find lots of critical stuff. If you go into an art gallery in, uh, in this part of the world, uh, every, every one of which presumably has to have some piece of, uh, of um, Kuhn's uh, in, in place, you'll find paragraph upon paragraph, often in the style of Jacques Lacan, like that thing that I read to you, uh, telling you that this, this is uh, at least as important as Michelangelo, because the same things can be said about both of them. So at what point in all this do we come to earth? Uh, or do we never come to earth? This, can we just live in this world of fakes forever? And that seems to be what um, essentially Coons is asking us to do. I call his work preemptive kitsch because it, he's preempting the judgment of it as kitsch. He's, he's making it so ostentatiously kitsch that you can't believe that it really is. So you hesitate to judge it and dismiss it as the second rate rubbish that it is. Uh, so do we have anything to contrast with this? Of course, that's, in, that's what you in this room are all working towards, ha, the, the thing that will contrast with this. Uh, I, I give a, a couple of examples here. Uh, uh, Andrew Wyatt, who alas has just, uh, just died, um, there is a simple piece of representational painting which I'm sure is familiar to many people in this room, in, in which um, there's a, a restoration of the innocent interest in the world as it is, and in particular uh, the, the plain white wall and all the blemishes contained in it and all the human meanings that you can see in it. Uh, that kind of painting is still avail available to us. And, and Wyeth's paintings, of course, have been extremely influential and popular in this country because they have captured not just the way things look, but also uh, the human reality behind it what, it, what it actually is to be an American in this difficult time. Uh, um, um, we have someone similar in David Inshaw. There's, that's just an example, uh, uh, you know, a very simple example of his painting. Just looking at some, a plain white wall, uh, and, the, and its surroundings, and trying to find in that whiteness uh, the, the reality, the human reality, uh, which, um, it, it, which it embodies because of the way in which the, these things have been used, or the lives into which it's been incorporated. That kind of representational art seems to me to be still available, and there's nothing kitsch about it, there's nothing fake about it, and yet we're supposed not to think that it's possible to do this. The, you know, the, the propaganda of the art schools will say, you know, this is all completely uh, uh, unavailable to us, that we're, we're in some sense pretending. Uh, whereas, of course, uh, it's much more, uh, much more reasonable to say that the pretense lies with people like Barnett Newman, who's a, 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 a paradigm case of a pretend artist, than, than with David Inshaw. Now, I'm coming to the, to the end, so I, I was going to give you a, a few thoughts on, on value before I finish. Uh, Oscar Wilde famously said that the cynic knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. Uh, and um, that's a very profound remark. You know, prices are things that we're familiar with. Prices are fixed by exchange. Everything has a price if you're prepared to exchange it. Um, so things with a price can be substituted for each other. They can be exchanged and compared. But value attaches to the things that we are reluctant to exchange and compare. You value your, your wife and your children, but you're, for that very reason, you're not going to exchange them. You know, there's no price that you're going to put on their head. But, um, uh, and of course, uh, this is very well known in the area of erotic love. Uh, or erotic feelings, that, that these cannot be priced, and as soon as you do price them, they belong to another moral sphere. They're put outside the normal realm uh, of human interactions. But uh, we still do think that we can price certain emotions. This is really what Walt Disney is all about, uh, the collection of emotional ready-mades which we can exchange for each other and which have a, uh, a, you know, a clear cost attached and so on. So um, what should we do by way, and, and, uh, finally, of avoiding this, avoiding putting all our emotions on sale? How, how, do we, how do we discriminate between works of art that do this and works of art that don't, and so on? That is really what the question is that, uh, that concerns us when we consider the whole history of kitsch. I just wanted to, to end with a, one or two little examples. 
It was often said of Utrillo, or Trio, uh, um, who was a, a Spanish painter who settled in Paris at the time of the Impressionists, that what he did was, was fake Impressionism. It, the, 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 this, it has all the cliches of the Impressionist idiom, but uh, with nothing that redeems it from uh, a, a mere competence. Uh, here is a, a picture of a street in Montmartre, a sweet sort of thing. Yeah, and it would look jolly good on, on the wall of a cafe. Uh, but is it real art? Uh, what is wrong with it, if, if, if anything? Uh, uh, here is a, something by Seurat, um, which ostensibly is the same sort of thing. And yet you do sense that there is a real life in the Seurat that isn't there in the Utrio. The figures are just as sketchy, but somehow they are standing in the landscape and absorbing their posture from it in the way that these figures are not. These figures are dolls put there for effect, but they have no uh, human relation, no emotional relation to the facades around them, and those facades are simple, simply sketches of somewhere nice. Uh, if you look at the trees in the Sirha, you see that those trees are actually animated by something. They are pointing uh, to their own uh, life uh, as potentially dying things. So, you know, you can see if you could make these sort of comparisons that indeed there is a distinction between the, between the fake and the real. And it's not just a, a matter of uh, the, the standard sentimentality. So, I will conclude with one image from a, a, a detail from a picture by Edward Hopper. That's again a piece of uh, representational art which says something we don't know quite what it, is, it does say, but you know that that's a real mug of coffee, don't you? Uh, and that there are real people sitting around it, and it has a, a significance in their lives, uh, and that the light falling on it is a light in which people actually live and exchange things. You know, when you paint like that, it, it, it is the case that you're trying to uh, extract from a, a particular situation and that's the human meaning that's contained in it, which is something that Utrillo was not doing in that picture of Montmartre. So thinking of those sort of examples, I think we can conclude that we really do make a distinction and ought to make a distinction and can make a distinction between real art, which is what you're aiming to produce, and fake art, which is actually what is being produced in the uh, usual art schools. So thank you. So, well, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I think uh, I, I, an American audience is always so wonderful, and um, <laughs> you haven't discovered that I'm a fake. Just a, <laughs> incredible. Um, but uh, I, I gather that there, there is time for questions, and I'm supposed to deal with questions, aren't I? Do, should, do I have a chairman, or I do, just... No, I direct. Let's take Let's take Jim. Yeah. Uh, John C. John C. Roger, Sorry. this is the beauty of social uh, networking. I have a question from a curator at the Grove Collection. Oh, and, gosh. Uh, and they'll be opening a collection in the fall full of Jeff Koons artwork. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to read you his question. And with okay. permission, can I make a short video of your answer? Is that acceptable? Okay, fine. Uh, it'll all go on the record from, from which I'm condemned. <laughs> this is from Ed Shan. He said, mm. ask Roger what it means to, quote, say something, as opposed to, quote, say nothing. And then there's a little bit more. The problem with a lot of what Scruton says is that his idea of meaning seems to be privileged and as undefinable as everybody else's. Yet he makes distinction in art between the meaningful and the meaningless in such a way that I guess we should just take his word for it. <laughs> All right, let me get my video going. <laughs> and uh, Roger, you're on. OK, well, uh, uh, it is a very interesting question. Uh, and. Um, my response is to say, of course, 
all that I've been talking about is extremely difficult to get clear in one's mind. I'm not saying that, I don't want to imply that I'm as clear about this uh, as uh, you know, my language might sometimes suggest. It is very difficult to know what we mean by meaning and the difference between meaning something and saying nothing. Uh, and um, it's precisely for this reason that there's this huge area in which people like Jeff Koons can, as it were, step in and occupy un uncontested space. Say, so look, you know, this whole place is, space has been cleared away because uh, kitsch has been forbidden. So I'm going to step in and claim it all and do this kitsch, but, but do it so horribly that everybody will know that I'm not really doing it. And that's, that's a very uh, clever strategy, uh, and it pays off. I think that sculpture was sold for $50 million at some stage. Um, and so, you know, all this, uh, all this indicates that uh, the effort to be real, the effort to say what things, what human life really is and what really matters is a hard one. We know that it, is, uh, that it exists, this effort. We know that there's a great difference between late Beethoven quartets and, um, let's say, you two. Uh, you know, uh, we know that, that Beethoven wrestled in a way that most of us are incapable of wrestling with the need to express our spiritual condition in a time of the loss of faith, you know, and he, he did it. So, um, and for that reason, his works are consoling to us and valuable to us and will be uh, for the rest of our lives. Uh, and I think uh, we have to recognize that human beings do need that. They need that exploration of what is deep in themselves. And uh, when art ceases to do this and just becomes another flippant joke, uh, then there's no real need for it anymore. That's a very good question. Um, there's a, a great difference between, between uh, showing a bit of the world uh, and, uh, uh, and um, by presenting it to the audience or the, the, the viewer and by actually showing it through exploring it and translating it into something else. Now, I, you know, any, every bed in the world is a perfect representation of itself. Um, you know, uh, and uh, my bed uh, is less disgusting than Tracy Emmons, but it's, uh, but it's just as accurate a presentation of what a bed might be. Uh, but a real artist, I take it in the film on, uh, on beauty, I take the example of, of, um, of Delacroix's bed in his, in the Musée de, de la Croix in Paris, in which he shows the, the, the tormented sheets from which he has just emerged. Uh, and this is not a presentation of an actual bed. It's a, it's a digest of a bed through the uh, perceiving eye of a very refined observer, somebody who is able to make those sheets into the symbol of the life that has escaped from them and make us know through the lie of the sheets just the, the character of the torment of the person whose sheets they are. That's something which is a completely different skill. It, it, it means actually perceiving the spiritual reality of objects. In, in Tracy M. in there is just the debris of her life. An interesting life, no doubt, uh, but increasingly, you know, um, uh, exhausted, uh, for, given the, the, the number of times that it's put on display. <laughs> so you, say that, uh, you might not say that the purpose of art is to show life as it truly is, but to create symbols through your translation. Well, <laughs> everybody, let, let's put it in another way, everybody shows himself as he really is, um, because even if he's a fake, you know, <laughs> there he is, that's what he is. But art, art, in my understanding, presents reality by in some way transforming it into a symbol of itself. 
So it isn't just the plain un, uh, uh, undoctored reality before you. It is something which has been made into an articulate presentation of itself, a translation of itself into, uh, into an idea. And this is what Hegel meant when he said that all art is the sensuous shining of the idea. I think that's really a very profound utterance, you know, that uh, we look to art uh, not just to present the things around us, but to redeem them in some way by finding within them a meaning which is greater than, uh, than the ordinary eye can observe. I'm wondering what you think the role of humor in art should be. Uh, uh, the role of, what is the role of humor in art is the question. H humor is a very interesting idea. Uh, um, the fact that human beings laugh at things is one of the most remarkable features of our condition. Uh, and um, of course there, are, there is an art form, comedy, which takes this as its ruling principle. Uh, uh, there are comic paintings. They tend not to be very successful. Uh, in theater, comedy works, works a little bit in music. Um, but I think one of the important things about humor, uh, and uh, this bears on your question, is that humor is something about which we make very explicit judgments. People who, who utter jokes that are in bad taste, you know, or, or um, sexist or, fem or um, racist jokes or whatever, t tend to be regarded with intense disapproval. Um, you know, and we all think that there is a difference between a refined sense of humor and a crude sense of humor. You know, someone who's constantly making sexual innuendos might have some kind of, uh, it might get a laugh every now and then, but most of us think that such a person is not the sort of person you want to spend your, your time with. And I think um, that has bearing on the role of humor in art. Uh, we think just the same in the, in the case of art, that the, the comic in art must also be controlled by aesthetic judgment, by, by a sense of what is appropriate uh, uh, and what, um, what is illuminating and what is merely crude and so on. So that uh, we do, ha we do uh, actually uh, think very intensely about this in judging comedies. Uh, and I suspect the same is true of painting. When, um, when Duchamp put his urinal in the, that exhibition, uh, he, he was um, really very lucky that nobody saw that it was a joke. Uh, partly because, um, you know, uh, it's not such a funny joke that it was obvious. Uh, and uh, anyway, art critics are notoriously humorless. Uh, and so, so it was taken seriously as though this were a gesture designed to um, uh, induce some kind of new understanding of what art is. Um, though apparently that urinal has disappeared, it was thrown out after the exhibition, uh, and, uh, and and uh, was by his sister, was it? Oh, there you are, right. Um, but of course, reproductions of it have been made and are in museums all all over the world, um, with the reproduced signature of R. Mutt and and all the rest. But I think uh, you know, jokes are an extremely interesting area in which we exercise our aesthetic judgment. Uh, and um, art is full of them. Well, Roger, you, the first question you received, uh, they asked you, why should we believe you as compared to believing Jeff Koons or yeah. nothing? And it, it seems obvious, you make sense. <laughs> and, and you can search your own mind and you search your own heart. And um, there's logic in what you say, and it, it, it seems very truthful. And I, I just thought I'd add mm. that two cents into that, that right. question. That you, you, uh, we better film that later, John. <laughs> 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 so, uh, George Gow, uh, my back hurts, I'll try to stand up. Uh, this is sort of hard to explain, but I, I think that because we're all artists, can you, can you hear me? Because we're all artists, we have a tendency to see the world the way we see it as, as, as artists, and why aren't people, you know, understanding, you know, 
what you're saying, but I think it goes to a deeper problem, which I, I want to know if you think I'm right or wrong. There seems to be such self-loathing in, in people who keep responding to this other stuff, to the, and, and teaching this other stuff is something mm -hmm. genius. There seems to be something at the core wrong with it. It's like, it goes to a kind of cynicism that like goes into like, I don't want to get to religious discussions, but it, it's almost like a, a lack of faith or something bigger than yourself and a lot of self-importance and self-loathing. And I mean, I know all my friends are basically impressionist painters and they seem very full of life and very happy. And, mm -hmm. and, and these other people that I also have to live there, like they pour the tears on them. They're just so dark in their worldview. And this to me is just a symptom of it, yeah. of something far bigger than what you serve. I think that's a very true observation. I do, of course, I didn't talk about, about this explicitly, but I think you can't understand the phenomenon I'm describing if you don't recognize exactly what you've said, that there, we live in a, a society, in a, con, a historical con, condition in which uh, a kind of self-loathing and repudiation of the human condition is, is normal and, it, and it's communicated to the young, uh, not necessarily by their teachers, but by the surrounding culture. Um, we have to fight against it and, and it's very hard to fight against it. When we live in a world saturated by uh, aggressive music and pornography and er everything that seems to make human beings into, into mere objects, to be, you know, mutilated or, or played with, uh, you know, there is very little room there for the for the real emotions and the re the real forms of, of human relationship. Even though we yearn for their, those things, and our yearning for those things is a religious yearning. That that is really what I think underlies your your sense that it, it is connected with religion. Um, it doesn't. It may not be that you believe in in God or in any particular uh, revealed faith, but still you have that yearning, the yearning to to see human life as potentially redeemable. So it isn't just, uh, a, 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 if you like, a, a succession of uh, of impressions, each one more boring than the last. And I think uh, uh, it, it's a. Young people today are in a really difficult position because they've entered a, a, um, a society created by people of my generation, which offers them very few exits from the, from the cycle of, uh, of um, mere impressions and, and excitements and so on. Yes, um, how do you think the situation could be changed? Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, so Next question. <laughs> <laughs> I think, well, obviously, the, my, my role as a sort of philosopher, a philosopher is, is to understand the situation, not, not to, to change it. <laughs> uh, but you know, Karl Marx famously said, you know, that hitherto philosophers have interpreted the world. The point, however, is to change it. Um, and look what he did. Um, you know, so we have a warning there. Um, I think it's what you're doing, as I understand it, is the right thing. Get together, think about this, set each other an example, criticize each other's work, and try always to be guided by a higher vision of the meaning of human life than that which is you're bombarded with from the media every day, you know, and I think um, if you can do that, perhaps uh, eventually it will crystallize. And I think, uh, you know, in music and literature, people do this, uh, and um, it's, I think it can be done in painting too. Gentleman over here in the yellow shirt there, and then uh, gentleman over here. Would, would you care to address the, the role of, of wealth, great wealth, in deciding What's going to be art and what's not? The role of wealth. Yes. Yeah. We've, we've seen these things that, that uh, idiots are paying multiple, yeah. multiple millions for, and yes. are, they, are they expressing that no matter what you feel, I say it's art? Yeah. Uh, th th this 
This is an interesting question, uh, the, the role of wealth in creating the art mar market. Um, it's a great tragedy, really, uh, for painting, that, it, that paintings can be owned. Uh, we, um, composers uh, and novelists and poets don't have this problem. Nobody can walk out of the symphony hall with a, with a symphony in his pocket, even if he pays 50 Five hundred million dollars for it, because the symphony exists in uh, another space, in a space where we can't, which can't, cannot be owned, uh, and um, it's because paintings can be owned and because their value depends upon what critics say about them that you get this strange, distorted art market. It's interesting that when Clement Greenberg launched his great. Uh, campaign to say that all representational art is kitsch and only avant-garde art is real art. Um, he, he dismissed Edward Hopper, for instance, um, who was the greatest American painter at the time, uh, as uh, second-hand cliches. Um, uh, in doing so, he, because uh, there gathered around him this a circle of complicitous faking that I've been talking about. Everybody said, yeah, that's right. It's only the avant-garde that works. And, uh, and, um, uh, and Clement Greenberg explicitly um, picked out de Kooning as his, uh, his example of where art should go, carefully buying up every possible de Kooning, meanwhile, uh, and made a killing. Uh, you know, I don't know what you think about de Kooning in this room, but to me, it's the lowest pay point at which avant-garde art ever, ever reached. Because um, it, it's not merely uh, incompetent from the draftsman's point of view, but also it does dirt on everything that it touches. But uh, it's hugely successful because of uh, Clement Greenberg's promotion of it, and, and by owning the de, Co de Koonings, he made himself a multi-millionaire. Uh, so, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it, I suppose it is insider trading, but it, it doesn't. But then it doesn't matter. You know, you have to think uh, in the long term. Uh, that money that uh, that people are so stupid as to spend on a de Kooning, it goes then to an artist who is very likely to be a drunkard with a lot of a wide circle of completely useless friends, uh, it will uh, uh, spread among them. It will be spent on useful biodegradable things like, like drink uh, and, uh, and reach through the rest of, of, of society much more quickly than if it, it had been in a bank account. So, uh, you know, this, this rubbish art actually has a very uh, benign economic function. Uh, <laughs> Doesn't that, <coughs> there seems to be a tie between how much cultural vocabulary we have around us every day and how much we can understand. The average person doesn't understand why blue is important for Our Lady, but they know what Hollywood marriages are dissolving. Yeah. Because that's what they're around. Yeah. Um, isn't the cultivated tourist helpful in that? Because they're building the vocabulary of the past or of that continual language. Uh, no, absolutely. I didn't mean to, to pour scorn on the cultivated tourist, just to, to point to the contrast of attitude between him and the, and the old lady praying to her favorite saint in, its, in, his, in, the, uh, in the kitsch version that she uh, happens to have uh, fixed on. Yeah, it, it is very important that we, we maintain the higher language of discussion of art, where, people, where we really try to say why and what it means and why. Uh, and uh, the cultivated tourist um, is obviously one of the heroes in, in this respect. And it's thanks to the, the cultivated tourist that all, all the great Renaissance works were, were preserved. It was Goethe's discovery of Italy and determination to go around looking at these things and bringing in his wake all the German en Enlightenment writers and so on that, that actually uh, it, um, created the topic of art history and made those little 
municipalities in Italy start um, protecting and treasuring what they had. Yeah, so we need uh, tourists and uh, representational artists. <coughs> tourists. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I think I, I, uh, from Europe there is a lot of production of representation of art which is out, uh, outside the newspapers, all the official media, the uh, official museums, the art critics don't want to uh, write about uh, representation yeah. art. So um, you, said, uh, you, you talked about uh, the that, you know, the the ownership or the how, yeah, about owning and that's I think the main enemy now for us mm. because how do you find them you say well uh, make sure paintings but I think it's not enough uh, I see for example in Holland a decline uh, of uh, representational art because there is no tension and also the economic crisis is attacking the galleries and so on and we have not won nearly uh, a thing in the public area so many artists have to stop uh, their selling I don't know because it's going so uh, so such a long time music in the music you see classical music uh, at the side of the modern yes. <laughs> but in the, in the visual arts we don't so universities and so on they don't pay attention they are always following green bear and so on yes. so I don't know that's my preoccupation how, how to change that well uh, yes I, uh, it's very difficult to change a whole culture um, all one can do is start something uh, and see how it spreads. You know, and I, I think that's really the only advice to be given. When, in the, in Europe in particular, there is an art establishment. Holland is notorious for this. Um, in fact, the Netherlands, I mean, uh, the, 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 that there is a government funding for the arts uh, and committees, bureaucrats who distribute this funding. And of course, uh, their one concern is to be modern and up to date and, uh, and at the fr front of things so that they won't be criticized as reactionary bourgeois and all the things that, that, that um, I regard as terms of praise. Um, <laughs> But, but and it's the same in uh, in modern music, in, in especially in in um, the Netherlands that the, the 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 subsidies go to the people whose music nobody wants to hear, uh, and um, that's one of the d disadvantages of a bureaucracy. A bureaucrats don't pay themselves the cost of what they subsidise. Uh, this is why we should be grateful for private owners because they buy things because they like them. Uh, the people who buy things from museums usually buy them because they hate them, because they think, ah, oh, if I hate it, it must actually be very modern and up to date. For a lot of us, I'm sure that um, we probably have a lot of the same opinions that the Greco-Roman ideal is the ideal. Um, in the way we view beauty, beauty and our relationship to the culture around us. I'm wondering how, what you think about the advent of democracy and how that has changed the validity of uh, the way we view the world and the work we produce and the validity of what we're trying to do because it's almost, because what we're doing is elitist in a sense uh, that we maintain these ideals and that we aren't open to the democratic I, well, we might be. How, how, do, how would you um, come to terms with those two different philosophies and, and the work that we're doing? Well, it, it's certainly true that democracy has changed the culture radically because it's given uh, a voice to people who in previous uh, centuries might not have had a voice. Uh, and um, the, then it also means that it has become difficult to criticize popular art or especially popular music or music that ha has the 
the allegiance of the mass of, of uh, humankind uh, because it looks so much as though you're just dismissing their right to have a taste of their own. And I think that is absolutely true. But if you look back over it, the history of democracy, though, especially American democracy, it hasn't always been associated with um, the worst form of popular taste. Uh, on the contrary, um, you know, just look at your tradition of, of painting. Someone like Winslow Homer, he, he was part of the whole democratic movement, the movement to celebrate the American people and its landscape, uh, and um, was a great painter in my view. Uh, and um, American music has always had this very strong democratic side to it, and of course produced in jazz the harmonic language which is now the language of popular music everywhere. Uh, and for a long time, jazz was a refined art form just like um, any other. Uh, it's declined, of course, but it's declined in another way, not, not purely because of the democratic side of it. So I think that one perhaps should try and uh, recuperate the good side of, de of democracy and recognize that, that one has a, a duty to educate the ordinary citizen and not just to accept his taste as valid simply because he has it. Yes, well, living in Los Angeles, of course, we celebrate the very thin plastic. Uh, the great theologian Don Henley, lead singer of the Eagles, said, Welcome to the land of fame and fizz, where you will find the package and use all the heaven. Mm -hmm. And listening to you on the fig, I felt like you're describing the same thing. In the contrast, Martin Hoover, Ikundu, Ryan Dow, do we need an audience that wants a deeper, more intimate relationship to sustain this? Is that what we need people that care for something deeper, more meaningful, or would this not find an audience? Well, uh, um, that goes back to the gentleman's uh, question over there about uh, the sort of degeneracy of, of, uh, of the surrounding culture. And I, I think what, what I would say is, is this, that there's a great difference between attending to something and being distracted by it. Uh, and we live in a culture where distraction is the, uh, the, the means that is used to attract other people's attention, rather than the presentation of something that, that is worthwhile in itself. Uh, you know, advertising is all about distraction. Uh, the, the, the ordinary language of the movies now captures people's attention by the five second cut, you know, so the, the, the eye is constantly gripped by it, constantly distracted, uh, but never actually fulfilled. And, and I think that the role of art in all this is to, is to put distraction to one side and, uh, and put attention in the place of it. And I think that's really what, what um, you have to be doing. I wanted to go on and on. Ah, but that, that's a very interesting question about the influence of modern, and as you were <coughs> from Kish to sellability of art, and of course that price stuff being everything to it, and the influence of money, but bringing the two together, don't you think that postmodernism, let's say Kunz, it's a really, take it for what it is, it's a really, we know that Kitsch sells, though the reason that Kitsch and the fake emotions on the street sells appealing to the emotion that it appeals, it just selling and pushing it on the street. Don't you think that postmodernism is doing exactly that? They do sell Kitsch under the wrapper and the pretense of irony, because that is what accessible to that buying pool of those who made a couple of billion bucks out of selling oil and for the same reason as buying it on the street in a church shop. Mm. Don't you think that essentially the entire linguistic of bumbo jumbo that you just described and, and the pretense of irony is just the way to sell something that they would buy anyways for five bucks for fifty billion bucks. Yeah. For fifty million bucks. Mm. That's a very very good way of putting it and I agree. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> that, that you you Irony is a very useful device because it enables you to, to do something which you know to be wrong while pretending you're not doing it. Uh, and that's really essentially what Jeff Koons is doing. And as you say, uh, it also reassures the buyer that, that this thing that he could get for five bucks in the street um, is actually worth whatever it is that he pays for it. 
Uh, yes, and this is a, it's a sad thing. We're, we're talking about uh, weaknesses in human nature, which it isn't possible to overcome. Uh, but in the long run, you know, when, you know, say in a few thousand years' time and all, everything's been reduced to rubble, uh, a, a, a new civilization will come along and they'll pick up those Jeff Koons objects uh, and they will be put in the, in, on the rubbish heap uh, and every now and then they'll come across a real work of art and say, look, here's something that they really did then. But, uh, you know, it takes time. I think so. Yeah. Yes. Can we uh, please say thank you to Roger Stewart? Thank you. Oh, oh. Yeah, very good audience. Yeah. Thank you very much.